now I think you well know is John Thomas. Uh, being a professor at a university has always been, I think, something that I, I wanted to do, but it gave me a chance to give you some ideas about what I wanted to do. And so I, the lecture that I gave to Omics Group, I gave them a number of lectures, and they said, One Health is a very germane topic. I must admit, I had no idea how important this topic has become. And if when you're done, I hope I can stimulate you in the next 25 minutes, that this absolute recognition now of the importance of animals to our own health, obviously the importance of the earth. And what I wanted to say to you, you know, we talk so much about keeping our antimicrobials in check and stewardship. I'd like you to think of this one health as stewardship of the microbes of the earth. And that's where we haven't gone too much. We've talked about stewardship of humans and our diseases, and now particularly antibiotic resistance. I'd like you to think of stewardship of the microbial world. And every lecture I give at school, be it the dental school or the medical school, starts out with this, the statement, we live in a microbial world. And I'd like you to remember that because it's sort of a theme that I'll go throughout. This microbial world, in my mind, is international, and I chose the flags of the United Nations because the interesting thing about microbes is they have no barriers. They have no borders. And the thing that I read in some journals was that there is no sanctuary of health. Now think about that. There is no sanctuary of health. So the globe inside and the recognition of all of those flags is because I feel very seriously about that. Now, to tell you how I educate that theme and to bring it forth to the group is to point out that I have now seven puppets, and uh, they provide me an option of different topics. And we're going to talk about Biofilm Bradford. You're going to meet historical Louis tomorrow, Louis Pasteur. But we're also going to talk about antibiotic witchy and resistance. And the other parts you will see on the second lecture, you may not have thought of this, but the wound of a mouth, oral health, and the wound of skin are almost overlays except for the absence of a tooth. So in reality, one of the emerging concepts of One Health is the concept that yeast and molds are much more paramount than the stability of our universe and in the health process. And when I use Candy Candida, don't, don't you like that name, Candy Candida? I love that kind of little song. I haven't written it yet, but Candy Candida. I don't think you realize, and I'm going to tell you how important yeast infections are, or yeast colonization of wounds, chronic wounds and biofilm formation. So that's where Candy Candida comes from. But today's lecture is to really recognize that one of the other reasons I'm here is that this one health and this globe and animal interface is particularly evident in the state that I represent, and that is West Virginia, where we have terrible terrible health issues. And I don't need to go through this list, but the reality is we're not proud of being what you see listed there, first in obesity, second in juvenile diabetes, and 49th overall in US healthcare. So the university that I have represented for 30, 25 years has been directed by the state to make some changes in our healthcare in that state. And so I'm here to sort of talk to you about that, but on a more global issue, and, and I must admit, I enjoyed the Pope's visit to the United States because he said something that dwelt with me, and that was he didn't talk about the globe, he talked about our room. Now you think about that. I mean, we think so much about the globe being so large and so encompassing, but he made the statement in one of his uh, presentations, he thought of it as a room, this room. And that brings it to a little more personal aspect, but I wanted to, you to think, one of the things I've so enjoyed about education is that my lovely wife, Penny, who I've been married to for 43 years, I don't know how she put up with those years, but we have traveled a great deal. This is in Tiananmen Square, but I want you to notice the dust. And this is in China. Not to say anything, but it was paramount in the recognition of the kinds of things. What is that doing to the microbial population? What is it doing to the sun rays? What is it doing to the oxygenation? So when you begin to see this global change, it's magnified by unusual events. I was in the Philippines when one of the largest typhoons came through. I was lecturing in the morning at 8 o'clock, and when I came out at noon, we were watching people drown. This is what we saw from the balcony that we were there. 
Climate change. People went underwater and they never came up again. And I felt absolutely helpless. I'm a, with, with my family, more than anything else I love to do is to ski. Penny and I are both Vermonters. Cold weather is my love affair. To be a patroller, a first responder, and to watch people go underwater and not being able to do anything was a very, very heart-rendering, soul-searching event. But it pointed out to me this whole idea of the globe that we share in this one room. And it also pointed out when I had a chance to go and look at some of the educational facilities having left West Virginia for our lecture and looking at this particular, we have at the Royal Indian University, and looking at the facilities in which their usage of limited resources was extraordinarily unique and efficient. And I felt a little embarrassed to be an American who had all kinds of resources, and yet what's the level of the education available? And so I was driven by the fact that we need to make sure we all use the tools as well as they were doing. I felt very impressed by the actual presentation. So the climate, the earth, our room, is actually a place where we live with microbes. I will use tomorrow a concept that I heard and I sort of integrated to my, this is dual citizenship. To raise the bar of what microbes are with us, they are our equal. They are, in fact, as I'll explain to you in a moment, more prevalent, as you know, than our eukaryotic cells. I think of them as dual citizens. They are citizens of the globe. And that's where One Health comes in, the reality that we need to work. So here was my initial thought process. I saw One Health as addressing animals, humans, globe, but where is the microbial composition in that One Health? One of the interesting things, what I do with my tea? Can I move for a minute to get my tea? Oh, yeah. One of the interesting things that suddenly began to realize is the silos that we have created. How many of you, and I will give you my example, have worked with a veterinarian school? In West Virginia, we don't have one. When one of the speakers that I was looking at on YouTube was talking about Washington, Washington State University is on the east part of Washington. The University of Washington Medical Schools in Seattle. We have made these incredible silos where the understanding of the microbial world doesn't exist between animals and humans. And that's totally wrong. I, as a microbiologist, a clinical microbiologist for 50 years, does my laboratory in a hospital take animal specimens? Why not? How important are they? So if there's nothing that I hope I can convey to you except from my learning experience by putting this together, the concept of animals and humans and the impact together we have on this one room is remarkable. And I've already directed my staff to start to build our laboratory in Pittsburgh to receive animal specimens because we're going to have new tools that can identify microbes that are animal origin and those that are human origin and be able to cross-reference those. So I've learned a great deal by putting this presentation together and I, I am, I'm amazed and embarrassed by the lack of knowledge that I have about veterinarian microbiology because it's been a silo. We never really dealt with animal diseases but in the last 30 years 75 percent of all infectious diseases in humans had an origin from an animal. And yet, what do, we, what do I as a microbiologist know much about animal microbes? Incredibly naive on those of us who have uh, you know, devoted ourselves to science. So it was interesting, one of the books that I read, one of the chapters said, you know, in reality, this is Newton's third law. For every reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction in the other direction. So if we influence animals or we influence humans and we influence the globe, for every reaction there is an equal and opposite reaction. It's, it's physics. It's Newton's third law. You cannot influence one without having influence on the other. And I'm not going, this lecture is not about poverty or population density. But if you back up and you look at that human origin and you begin to realize, as you know, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, the amount of poverty in the world, 50% of the people in this globe, of the seven to nine million people, have serious problems. So there's two issues on humans, the numbers of us and those who live as they are shown on the left-hand side. 
Think about this then, what is the microbial population in the background of either population? The density and those who live not like we are living. Yet they occupy 50% of our population. There is a going to be, what I really was interested in when somebody came up with this next statement, do you know what we're gonna be calling this? The perfect microbial storm. It is about to happen. Now, I don't want to stay up here and, and be a doomsdayer and say things are going to be bad, but I had never heard of the statement that in the reality of this imbalance and Newton's third law, we are setting the parameters to have an incredible overgrowth, if you will, or shift in the microbial pool that we must deal with animals, humans, and globe. And if we don't work as a team, so one of the hopes that I had for this meeting was that I would like to get to know you and I'd hope that you'd like to get to know me because we need to discuss what we are each gaining and able to contribute in working with those of us who don't necessarily do exactly what we do. I don't know if there's any veterinarians here. I thought I saw it. That's what made me so happy when I saw that. Why aren't you and I talking? I'm, seriously, I don't, I don't mean to be sarcastic, but I, I mean to imply that this statement says, and the recognition that we are gaining, that animal part is totally unrecognized. I was listening to something, I'm not a social media person, my daughter will tell you, I can barely turn on my computer. I still remember slide rules. Do any of you know what a slide rule was when they were doing, you know, that to me was the height of my education in college, and today we have the instruments we have. But the reality is we've got to recognize that interface. So the perfect storm is what I think is going to come. And this is why. If you look at these numbers and you look at those diseases and you look at the costs and you look at the number of animal interfaces, it's unbelievable. And I don't have the time to go through each of these, but I would rather that you recognize that the numbers are, are clearly not within the realm of a lot of countries. Here is the point, though, that I would add to that. A, money, B, cost, C is as addressed in the Human Microbiome Project. We are losing our ancestral microbiology, bacteriology, fungi, yeast, parasites. What does that mean relative to our defense mechanism as we face the perfect storm? So if the perfect microbiology is beginning to emerge, by the population that is now not able to defend itself, by the interface of animals presenting diseases that we never recognize of being so important in veterinarian medicine. And the reality is that you and I are not the same people that we as our historians had with our microbiota. It's now estimated that we now have less than 50% of the gut flora that was evident in the Ice Age when they were recovering frozen bodies from the Alps in the Ice Age. Are we at risk because we don't have the communication with microbes that were at the time important features of our immune defense system? So I'd like you to think about that, that we clearly have to continue to work in a sense that not only do we have the animals, not only do we have the globe, but we don't have the animal interface that gave us our continual aspects. So uh, this slide is, all it wants to point out to you, what I really like to, to make you see, is that those organisms in our history that over time in the yellow part are going to come back and be part of the environment that we must deal with. Yet on the other hand, you'll see that some of the blue is what organisms we had and we carried when we were part of the earth early on. Things have changed dramatically. And it merely points out you and I in our dual citizenship don't, contain, don't have the same microbial flora that we used to have. And that's, that's we're going to pay for that. Why am I going backwards? Ah, because I'm pushing it backwards. Challenge to you. If we live in a microbial world and we're gonna have the perfect storm, where's it gonna come from? Animals for sure, humans who don't have natural defense. But look at the majority of the microbial world that you and I deal with, the 16S and 18S, Look at the number of microbes that we know about. We don't know our microbial world. So when you look at humans, and you look at animals, and then you look at our globe as that perfect triangle, 
we know something about animals. We know a fair amount about us. We know nothing about the world that is, surrounds us. And to me, that also is another major issue. So in reality, what, and again, given that I'd love to give this lecture, you and I are really a superorganism with dual citizenship of this combination. However, at the time of biofilm Bradford, and the time of when the Earth started, our population was much more oriented to a pool we don't see now. We don't have that microbial population. We didn't realize that the beginning of the globe was associated with what form of preventative microbiology? Biofilms. Biofilms were preventable means of protecting themselves, the microbes, from the environment. Now when you move forward and go to the environment of planktonic phyllis, the better earth, and then today, please remember that in the globe, in the animals, and in the human, the majority of microbes that will be part of the perfect storm exist predominantly in biofilm Bradford's organization. And one of the things we need to realize is that when organisms deal and grow with us, they're going to be habitat that affect a biofilm. How much do we know about managing biofilms? So not only do we have a perfect storm, we have a perfect storm for microbes that in history, at the beginning, address their survival by living as biofilms. You and I have dealt with Louis Pasteur, one bug, one disease. That's not where most of our patients are going to be. That's not where the earth is going to be. That's not where the globe is going to be. So how much more time do I have? How much, Nick, am I still OK? Yeah, actually, you're way ahead. We have 23 minutes. Oh, well, let's all have a little break here. And uh, <laughs> no, I think I'm about 10 minutes, right? So, you <laughs> well, good. Well, I can slow down and relax. Here, here is what I'd like to say to you. If you back up and you look at this slide here, this microbial population that in the beginning of our globe was predominantly biofilm to the left, that's 3.4 billion years ago, transitioning to a Louis Pasteur environment that was suggestive of a means of transmission, which gave us planktonic phyllis which then as you and I evolved into medicine and we learned about devices, we learned about public intervention, but particularly plastics in our patients, we began to realize that in fact, a lot of what we provided was in an exact environment that duplicated the biofilm magnitude of infections. And yet my clinical lab, I'm embarrassed to say, 26 texts, we receive a huge amount of specimens from very sick patients what organism, do I, what phenotype do I recover? Planktonic phyllis, planktonic organisms. Every micro lab generally in the clinical scenario has no ability to recover biofilms. And yet that is in the issue. Every infectious process has both planktonic phyllis and biofilm Bradford. And yet we only have focused in the last post Louis Pasteur era on planktonic phyllis. That's, that's going to bite us as we approach this one earth, one health, one animal environment in a super biofilm evolution that returns microbes to the time of 3.4 billion years ago because they grew as a biofilm. That is their preeminent means of growth. Why do I make this point? Humans, microbes, earth, animals. If you look at the number of genes that we have, we have about 23,000, approximately, a guesstimate. If you look at generally, as an overview, for a discussion academic point, we have 10 to the 12 eukaryotic cells, but our dual citizens with whom we share the microbial world in us, it's 10 to the 14. There are about 8 million genes in you, in your dual citizenship, that are prokaryotic. If you look at yourself as a gene pool, who has greater strength, prokaryotes or eukaryotes? Why do we think we can beat the eukaryotes having more strength than the prokaryotes? We cannot. 
So one of the issues that I will say to you as I develop both the wound and then Kristen and I do later this afternoon, a microbial clock, the reality is we must learn to work with our other citizen of ourselves and the globe, and that's the genomic pool that is the microbial world that we live in. We cannot continue to try to beat it. We have not done so, we won't do so, and the reality is that's part of the explanation. So when you look at the perfect microbial storm, think of it as a genetic event. If you don't want to talk about microbes, and you don't like naming all the renames that we come up with in microbiology, please think of it as a contribution of gene strength. And the reality is this perfect microbial storm that's an interface between animals, humans, and our environment or the globe gives them the strength to move forward. So one of the things I've been very interested in as I've traveled and met you and went to different places is how do we make this surveillance? How do we begin to under stand and unmask this global phenomenon. And I remember, remember we had this, we've had this recognition of tsunamis. And I had never known that in the bottom of the ocean, different countries have put detectors to measure earth changing events so they could actually predict around the globe where a tsunami might occur based on the movement of the water and of its response to the earth shoving up and giving essentially an earthquake. What's our earthquake management? H how do I know what's going on in Italy? How do I know what's going on in Syria? How do I know what's going on in China? How do I know what's going on anywhere in this microbial perfect storm? So with the world's evolution and its information exchange, the kids, our daughters, get on the social media network and have communicated viral events in a moment. Why can't we do that with microbiology, transferring information? So one of my points in want to, I wanted to be here was to talk to the faculty, to talk to our esteemed interviewers, and say to them, we, we've got to do, we can't leave here without having started to communicate. And I'm very serious about that because now that we have a veterinarian, which is marvelous, and that I and you represent public health, and then we have the globe, but we need to think about this environment and we need to be addressing how we can communicate together. So just to put forward what I learned, and maybe if you know this, I am hopeful I'll reiterate it. I did not realize how, how large an issue One Health had become. Go to your Google, whatever you use, strike One Health. You will be amazed how many um, YouTube presentations come up. Penny and I were waiting for our daughter yesterday and we were looking at YouTube just because we've never done that really before. And I struck One Health and there were eight immediate presentations done by I think very reputable scientists uh, on the issue of One Health. I didn't realize how extreme that has become as an issue to some. And the reality is one of the issues in one of the textbooks then that I ordered was to outline what is One Health? What is the concept of humans, animals, and globe. And there it is. There is an interdependence between human, animals, and environmental health and a need to improve dialogue. Pretty obvious. That's why we're here. Number two, communication, collaboration, and trust between human and animal health practitioners. If I've learned anything in helping prepare this presentation, it's what I don't know about veterinarian medicine and what I do need to know because people are beginning to st sound a large alarm that we have to have a much better way of understanding what the animal resources are relative to SARS. Why do we have SARS? Why do we have other bird origin diseases? Why do we have Ebola? Why do we have these emerging diseases? And in one of the texts that I read, the guesstimate is that we will have two to four new diseases every year that are going to be of animal origin. We've always been silos. If it's in the Mediterranean, I don't care about it. If it's in Asia, it's not my problem. That's, that's just got to end. We must communicate. So I like this idea. The third point I haven't thought much about. One Health extends to food safety and food security and social behavior. Wow. As a microbiologist, I never really thought about food microbiology and the, the evaluation of what it presents. There is a need to promote the double, such as improving surveillance and response, and that's what I'm talking about. 
So things that, as, as a microbiologist, when I think about the globe, I don't think this way. Land usage. I listen to NPR, National Public Radio, when I come home on uh, Wednesday night. I go to Pittsburgh every Tuesday morning, and I work at Allegheny Health Network, and then stay overnight in Pittsburgh, and then work with the, the University of uh, Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon, and then work with the laboratory and come home Wednesday night. I listen to NPR. There was a discussion about how many trees are destroyed per day. And that led to the question is, how many trees are there in the globe? And the investigators who were presenting their data on NPR had a guesstimated that what the public knew was a general number. And they came up with a rather scientific study of three years. Do you know how many trees we are losing per day? 10 million. And that's that land usage, South America particularly. Other countries which are clearing land because people need land, animals need resources, and trees are in the way. So I, I never think about that. 10 million trees a day are going. So what does that mean? What does food and agricultural mean? What does human behavior mean in that environmental system? So I, I'm, I'm a bit embarrassed to say that what I did do then was I went and looked at some of these um, established surveillance systems that are now available. And I went to each one and pulled them up. And these are just some of the systems that are available that begin to address this emergency recognition of not waiting till SARS comes to the US or SARS goes to Canada or SARS goes to England. We need to know when SARS is starting, at what point it starts. And these systems are, I think, some of the ones that I felt I could use some time and practice with. And all of them basically have seen this UN concept that we need to address where the exposure is occurring, is there an infection, what is the vehicle of transmission, and what is the epidemic spread. You know, as a microbiologist, I understood that when I took up my first course, but I haven't thought about that in, since I left graduate school, and that's in 69, folks, when I left graduate school. Yet this now is in public health, and in one globe, one animal, one human, that's important. But we need to know it when it happens, down at the very beginning when the exposure occurs. So I, I with my students, use these. Um, I do use um, the health map, which is um, by um, Google. I make my students read to me what is the most recent outline. It's down at the healthmap.org. You Google that, and you'll see listed by publication and or by surveillance diseases that are current and if you make the globe really big and you move it around, you can click on an area and you can get some information. I make my students, when they come in every day, give me three new disease, not new, three diseases that they have managed or been unaware of. The other one I make my students use is called Gideon. Gideon is a global diagnostic tool. And if you've never gone to the site, www.gideononline.com, please do, it is a the really the first attempt, I shouldn't say first, it is a most sophisticated attempt to make clinical diagnosis with computer input. And by knowing the features of what I just presented, when did it occur, who was the contact, how long did it take for the incubation period, the diseases that begin to appear are absolutely within a diagnostic realm of coming close to what a physician would say. But it's computerization. So please do those, if nothing else, as tools that you might use. And I, I merely put this up just to, to make an issue about the globe. Climate change, visits, the White House. It's not that I wanted to make that the issue, but I wanted to make the issue that, that people are beginning to address this. And this is the now recognized logo for One Health. And if you Google it, this is what you will see. I, I admonish you, I beg you, I clearly want you to recognize this. I am done. That this is what we as scientists, public health, veterinarians, medical research people, we live in a globe that needs our support. You are inhabited by a dual health of microbes that are genetically capable of outperforming our own genes. And if we don't do this together, uh, she's going to suffer, my children. And that's what we all want, is a stable environment for her to promote forward. So with that, I hope you'll just think of this as sort of my 
my uh, overview of where I think we should be. And uh, when I go to each of my lectures and I'll use my puppets and talk about, I'll bring this theme back. One Health, we must communicate with animals, humans, and the globe, recognizing we want to avoid a perfect microbial storm, but I'm not very comfortable that that's going to happen. I think we're going to see more of it. So thank you very much. Thank you.